It's a very exciting time to be here at NYU. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of momentum. People come to us and say, you know, what's going on at NYU? And to have a new space that is state of the art, which is going to really house people with different disciplines and be a hub of science, we're going to be able to do much more and exciting things in the future. So what we're interested in is really trying to understand how an embryo develops. And this is a really special time at the very beginning of embryogenesis because you go from two cells that are highly specialized, a sperm cell and an oocyte, to a, a cell capable of producing the whole body again. And so what we're interested in understanding is how the genome gets reprogrammed to go from this specialized cell type to this general, very general cell. Specifically in the genome of an invertebrate model system that we work with, we know that about 3,000 genes out of about 20,000 in the genome are required to make an embryo. This is the only animal for which we have this information. So we compare this to humans, and we find that over 90% are clearly found also in the human genome. So we know we're studying something that is fundamental. We want to have a system view. How does the system get put together? Using these kinds of tools, we can approach questions all the way from pollution, trying to get biofuels to be developed better, to medicines, to developing ways to now attack a disease, not just by thinking of it as a particular element like a gene going wrong, but as a system-wide problem that a cell is undergoing, and, and, and how do you attack that so that you can repair it. Really, genomics permeates everything from medicine to biodefense to agriculture. So our work on plant genomics encompasses the work on the plants themselves, and that would be the model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana. Our work also transcends plants, because I have to tell you that about 30% of the plant genome is conserved in humans. So some parts of the projects that we're doing, actually, in my lab has to do with uh, using plants to study the function of brain receptors that are shared between plants and humans. And part of that project is around the fact that plants actually make drugs that work on human brain receptors, which is why most of our medicines come from plants. Every experiment we do has 25,000 readouts because there's approximately 25,000 genes in the Arabidopsis genome. So another big part of what we do is analyzing the data, and we do that with computers, and that's called bioinformatics. Our software package, The Virtual Plant, is an NSF-funded project to develop tools that enable researchers to integrate many kinds of genomic data. A large part of my research is focused on rice um, and trying to understand, actually, the genome of rice. Currently, of the six or seven billion people in the world, about three billion are dependent on rice uh, in some form uh, in for their nutrition. And what we're trying to do is to understand a network of genes that have evolved with the evolution of rice for increasing yield uh, in rice and also increasing the quality of rice around the world. In this current world environment where the population is increasing rapidly and land and water, which are two major resources you need in agriculture, is shrinking, we need many different tools to try to develop new varieties of crop plants, including rice, that will meet these changing demands in, in the future. In the new building, the possibility is, is basically to see what we're doing now, but on steroids. Because we will have a lot more people, a lot more brain power, and very easy to, to go between one discipline and another. Open laboratory spaces are good because they allow you to essentially do science without walls and allow people to interact across research disciplines, across laboratories. Currently, the way most open laboratories are designed are in horizontal um, spaces. That is, one entire big room or one big floor is an open laboratory. But what happens is that you segregate people in different floors. The way the open laboratory plan in the new building is designed is to 
keep the open laboratory um, concept in the horizontal space that we've had a lot of success with, but to now add a vertical um, open laboratory space where you have staircases that connect different floors together to make it easier to access different floors. And so we essentially expand um, the scope of our interactions. And this is something that, that is actually very unique. We've now become a three-dimensional entity rather than just a two-dimensional entity. It's really key to have an environment where people can interact with each other freely and easily, where there are no walls as much as possible, where the biology bench is right next to a computer desk, so that people that are working in these different areas could either switch sides or talk to each other all the time without any barriers. And I think this is one of NYU's signatures in the way that we are making our center develop in architecturally even, in a way that people are completely able to interact with each other. The building of the Genome Center will be the jewel in the crown and the pinnacle of what we've been striving for in our recruitment of genomic faculty. We've hired eight new faculty in genomics and systems biology and bioinformatics. Um, and those include faculty from Stanford and Rockefeller and one that turned down MIT physics to come to us. So it's already brought to us a core faculty of about 10 and will grow to a size of 16. I find NYU a special place to do genomics research. Uh, it's a fairly interdisciplinary research university. That's one of the things I love about NYU is that it fosters interdisciplinary research and the kind of work we do really thrives in an interdisciplinary research environment. Um, and so here um, at NYU, I find myself surrounded by people who, who don't think like me, and that's something that I, I really treasured. And it was one of the major reasons I decided to move here, um, as opposed to other um, places that were trying to uh, recruit me. We will train our undergraduates and master's students and postdocs in this new technology in ways you can't just teach in a classroom. We will also have beautiful classrooms that are computer-aided so we can teach them how to use bioinformatics. So the center really transcends even just the research. And as, a, as an educational institution, you know, educating the next generation of scientists about genomics. And so we believe that the physical presence of the center will advance basic research, applied research, and education. And I don't think you can ask for more than that. This is an area right now in biology, molecular biology genomics, where really there is a transformation of everything going from uh, what we knew before to an area that is at the same time exciting as it is mysterious. People have made the analogy to the time when physics went basically from Newtonian type physics to 20th century physics. And, and this 21st century is really about making that transformation in biology. I get a steady stream of visitors from all around the world who want to see what we're doing here in this, in this new um, 21st century space that we're designing. I mean, think of the possibilities um, when the new building's office, we're going to be the hub of research nationally and internationally. We already are well known throughout the world for our research. We're go we are going to then become really a destination for genome research uh, in the world when this facility is opened. It'll probably be uh, the precursor for new ways of doing science and new ways of designing um, spaces for, for scientists and how they work in the 21st century.